welcome to the Reality Revolution. I am your host, Brian Scott, and I'm so excited to return to Ralph Waldo Trine. After about four episodes, I finally realized what is so special about Ralph Waldo Trine's In Tune with the Infinite. This amazing book that speaks to me on so many levels is so simply put and talks about these major lessons in the spirit in such a unique way. And I realized what he had done. Each chapter is sort of a channeling of a different spirit of God. So you have some different episodes we've done so far. We've done the spirit of infinite love. We've done the spirit of infinite power. And recently I read the spirit of infinite wisdom. There's just some powerhouse chapters in this book. And each one is delivered in a way you don't need to have read any of the other chapters. Sort of like a channeling. This is written in the early 1900s. So it's done in a different way. He's speaking from a voice that is very beautiful and it resounds with the stories that he's telling. It's really interesting to go back to these older authors because they touched on this from a more simplistic and innocent perspective. And it's much more powerful and believable coming from that perspective. A lot of the writers from today have a sort of darkness and less positivity. When you read some of the reality transurfing stuff, it's a dark view when you start to look at pendulums and different things. So it's really exciting to read some of these early works that were so filled with positivity. And we're going to talk about the spirit of life on this one, which is a chapter called fullness of life, bodily health and vigor. It's a discussion of life in general and health and the spirit of these things. God is the spirit of infinite life. If we are partakers of this life and have the power of opening ourselves fully to its divine inflow, it means more so far as even the physical life is concerned than we may at first think. For very clearly the life of this infinite spirit from its very nature can admit of no disease. And if this is true, no disease can exist in the body where it freely enters through which it freely flows. Let us recognize at the outset that so far as the physical life is concerned, all life is from within out. There is an immutable law which says as within, so without cause effect. In other words, the thought forces, the various mental states and the emotions all have in time their effects upon the physical body. Someone says, I hear a great deal said today in regard to the effects of the mind upon the body. But I don't know as I place very much confidence in this. Don't you? Someone brings you sudden news. You grow pale and tremble, or perhaps you fall into a faint. It is, however, through the channel of your mind that the news is imparted to you. A friend says something to you, perhaps at the table, something that seems very unkind. You're hurt by it. As we say, you have been enjoying your dinner. From this moment, your appetite is gone. But what was said entered into and affected you through the channel of your mind. Look, yonder goes a young man dragging his feet, stumbling over the slightest obstruction in the path. Why is it? Simply that he is weak-minded, an idiot. In other words, a falling state of mind is productive of a falling condition of the body. To be sure-minded is to be sure-footed. To be uncertain in mind is to be uncertain in step. Again, a sudden emergency arises. You stand trembling and weak with fear. Why are you powerless to move? Why do you tremble? And yet you believe that the mind has but little influence upon the body. You are for a moment dominated by a fit of anger. For a few hours afterwards, you complain of a violent headache. And still, you do not seem to realize that the thoughts and emotions have an effect upon the body. A day or two ago, while conversing with a friend, we were speaking of worry. My father is greatly given to worry, he said. Your father is not a healthy man, I said. He is not strong, vigorous, robust, and active. I then went on to describe to him more fully his father's condition and the troubles which afflicted him. 
He looked at me in surprise and said, Why, you do not know my father? No, I replied. How then can you describe so accurately the disease with which he is afflicted? You have just told me that your father is greatly given to worry. When you told me this, you indicated to me cause. In describing your father's condition, I simply connected with the cause its own peculiar effects. Fear and worry have the effect of closing up the channels of the body so that the life forces flow in a slow and sluggish manner. Hope and tranquility open the channels of the body so that the life forces go bounding through it in such a way that disease can rarely get a foothold. Not long ago, a lady was telling a friend of a serious physical trouble. My friend happened to know that between this lady and her sister, the most kindly relation did not exist. He listened attentively to her delineation of her troubles, and then looking her squarely in the face in a firm but kindly tone, said, Forgive your sister. The woman looked at him in surprise and said, I can't forgive my sister. Very well then, he replied. Keep the stiffness of your joints and your kindred rheumatic troubles. A few weeks ago, he saw her again. With a light step, she came toward him and said, I took your advice. I saw my sister and forgave her. We have become good friends again. And I don't know how it is, but somehow or other from the very day, as I remember, that we became reconciled, my troubles seemed to grow less. And today there is not a trace of the old difficulties left. And really, my sister and I have become such good friends that now we can scarcely get along without one another. Again, we have effect following cause. We have several well-authenticated cases of the following nature. A mother has been dominated for a few moments by an intense passion of anger, and the child at her breast has died within an hour's time. So poisoned became the mother's milk by virtue of the poisonous secretions of the system while under the domination of this fit of anger. In other cases, it has caused severe illness and convulsions. The following experiment has been tried a number of times by a well-known scientist. Several men have been put into a heated room. Each man has been dominated for a moment by a particular passion of some kind, one by an intense passion of anger, and others by different other passions. The experimenter has taken a drop of perspiration from the body of each of these men, and by means of a careful chemical analysis, he's been able to determine the particular passion by which each has been dominated. Practically the same results revealed themselves in the chemical analysis of the saliva of each of the men. Says a noted American author, an able graduate of one of our greatest medical schools, and one who has studied deeply into the forces that build the body and the forces that tear it down. The mind is the natural protector of the body. Every thought tends to reproduce itself, and ghastly mental pictures of disease, sensuality, and vice of all sorts produce scrofula and leprosy in the soul, which reproduces them in the body. Anger changes the chemical properties of the saliva to a poison dangerous to life. It is well known that sudden and violent emotions have not only weakened the heart in a few hours, but have caused death and insanity. It has been discovered by scientists that there is a chemical difference between the sudden cold exudation of a person under a deep sense of guilt and the ordinary perspiration. And the state of mind can sometimes be determined by chemical analysis of the perspiration of a criminal, which, when brought into contact with selenic acid, produces a distinctive pink color. It is well known that fear has killed thousands of victims, while on the other hand, courage is a great invigorator. Anger in the mother may poison a nursing child. Rarely, the celebrated horse tamer said that an angry word would sometimes raise the pulse of a horse ten beats in a minute. If this is true of a beast, what can we say of its power upon human beings, especially upon a child? Strong mental emotion often causes vomiting. Extreme anger or fright may produce jaundice. A violent paroxysm of rage has caused apoplexy and death. Indeed, in more than one instance, a single night of mental agony has wrecked a life. Grief, long-standing jealousy, constant care, and corroding anxiety sometimes tend to develop insanity. Sick thoughts and discordant moods are the natural atmosphere of disease, and crime is engendered and thrives in the miasma of the mind. From all this, we get the great 
fact that we are demonstrating scientifically today. That the various mental states, emotions, and passions have their various peculiar effects upon the body. And each induces in turn, if indulged in to any great extent, its own peculiar forms of disease, and these in time become chronic. Just a word or two in regard to their mode of operation. If a person is dominated for a moment by, say, a passion of anger, there is set up in the physical organism what we might justly term a bodily thunderstorm, which has the effect of souring or rather of corroding the normal, healthy, and life-giving secretions of the body, so that instead of performing their natural functions, they become poisonous and destructive. And if this goes on to any great extent by virtue of their cumulative influences, they give rise to a particular form of disease, which in turn becomes chronic. So the emotion opposite to this, that of kindness, love, benevolence, goodwill, tends to stimulate a healthy, purifying, and life-giving flow of all the bodily secretions. All the channels of the body seem free and open. The life forces go bounding through them, and these very forces set into a bounding activity will in time counteract the poisonous and disease-giving effects of their opposites. A physician goes to see a patient. He gives no medicine this morning, yet the very fact of his going makes the patient better. He has carried with him the spirit of health. He has carried brightness of tone and disposition. He has carried hope into the sick chamber he has left it there in fact the very hope and good cheer he has carried with him has taken hold of and has had a subtle but powerful influence upon the mind of the patient and this mental condition imparted by the physician has in turn its effects upon the patient's body and so through the instrumentality of this mental suggestion the healing goes on know then whatever cheerful and serene supports the mind supports the body too Hence, the most vital movement mortals feel is hope, the balm and lifeblood of the soul. We sometimes hear a person in weak health say to another, I always feel better when you come. There is a deep scientific reason underlying that statement. The tongue of the wise is health. The power of suggestion so far as the human mind is concerned is a most wonderful and interesting field of study. Most wonderful and powerful forces can be set into operation through this agency. One of the world's most noted scientists recognized everywhere as one of the most eminent anatomists living tells us that he has proven from laboratory experiments that the entire human structure can be completely changed, made over within a period of less than one year, and that some portions can be entirely remade within a period of a very few weeks. Do you mean to say, I hear it asked, that the body can be changed from a diseased to healthy condition through the operation of interior forces? Most certainly, and more, this is the natural method of cure, the method that has as its work the application of drugs, medicines, and external agencies is the artificial method. The only thing that any drug or any medicine can do is to remove obstructions, that the life forces may have simply a better chance to do their work. The real healing process must be performed by the operation of the life forces within. A surgeon and physician of worldwide fame recently made to his medical associates the following declaration for generations past, the most important influence that plays upon nutrition, the life principle itself, has remained an unconsidered element in the medical profession and the almost exclusive drift of its studies and remedial paraphernalia has been confined to the action of matter over mind. This has seriously interfered with the evolutionary tendencies of the doctors themselves, and consequently the psychic factor in professional life is still in a rudimentary or comparatively undeveloped state. But the light of the 19th century <laughs> has dawned, and so the march of mankind in general is taken in the direction of the hidden forces of nature. Doctors are now compelled to join the ranks of students in psychology and follow their patrons into the broader field of mental therapeutics. There is no time for lingering, no time for skepticism or doubt or hesitation. He who lingers is lost, for the entire race is enlisted in the movement. 
I am aware of the fact that in connection with the matter we are now considering, there has been a great deal of foolishness during the past few years. Many absurd and foolish things have been claimed and done, but this says nothing against it, and it has absolutely nothing to do with the great underlying laws themselves. The same has been true of the early days of practically every system of ethics or philosophy or religion the world has ever known. But as time has passed, these foolish, absurd things have fallen away, and the great eternal principles have stood out ever more and more clearly defined. I know personally of many cases where an entire and permanent cure has been effected in some within a remarkably short period of time through the operation of these forces. Some of them are cases that had been entirely given up by the regular practice, materia medica. We have numerous accounts of such cases in all times and in connection with all religions. And why should not the power of effecting such cures exist among us today? The power does exist, and it will be actualized in just the degree that we recognize the same great laws that were recognized in times past. One person may do a very great deal in connection with the healing of another, but this almost invariably implies cooperation on the part of the one who is thus treated. In the cures that Christ performed, he most always needed the cooperation of the one who appealed to him. His question almost invariably was, Dost thou believe? He thus stimulated into activity the life-giving forces within the one cured. If one is in a very weak condition, or if his nervous system is exhausted, or if his mind, through the influence of the disease, is not so strong in its workings, it may be well for him for a time to seek the aid and cooperation of another. But it would be far better for such one could he bring himself to a vital realization of the omnipotence of his own interior powers. One may cure another, but to be permanently healed, one must do it himself. In this way, Another may be most valuable as a teacher by bringing one to a clear realization of the power of the forces within. But in every case, in order to have a permanent cure, the work of the self is necessary. Christ's words were almost invariably, Go and sin no more, or thy sins are forgiven, thee, thus pointing out the one eternal and never-changing fact, that all diseases and its consequent suffering is the direct or the indirect result of the violation of law, either consciously or unconsciously, either intentionally or unintentionally. Suffering is designed to continue only so long as sin continues, sin not necessarily in the theological but always in the philosophical sense, though many times in the sense of both. The moment the violation ceases, the moment one comes into perfect harmony with the law, the cause of the suffering ceases. And though there may be residing within the cumulative effects of past violation, the cause is removed, and consequently there can be no more effects in the form of additions, and even the diseased condition that has been induced from past violation will begin to disappear as soon as the right forces are set into activity. There is nothing that will more quickly and more completely bring one into harmony with the laws under which he lives than this vital realization of his oneness with the infinite spirit which is the life of all life. In this there can be no disease, and nothing will more readily remove from the organism the obstructions that have accumulated there, or in other words, the disease that resides there, than this full realization and the complete opening of oneself to this divine inflow. I shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live. The moment a person realizes his oneness with the infinite spirit, he recognizes himself as a spiritual being, and no longer as a mere physical material being. He then can no longer make the mistake of regarding himself as a body subject to ills and diseases, but he realizes the fact that he is spirit, spirit now as much as he ever will or can be, and that he is the builder, and so the master of the body, the house in which he lives, and the moment he thus recognizes his power as master, he ceases in any way to allow it the mastery over him. He no longer fears the elements or any of the forces that he now in his ignorance allows to take hold of and affect the body. The moment he realizes his own supremacy, 
Instead of fearing them, as he did when he was out of harmony with them, he learns to love them. He thus comes into harmony with them, or rather, he so orders them that they come into harmony with them. He who formerly was the slave has now become the master. The moment we come to love a thing, it no longer carries harm for us. There are almost countless numbers today, weak and suffering in body, who would become strong and healthy if they would only give God an opportunity to do His work. To such I would say, don't shut out the divine inflow. Do anything else rather than this. Open yourselves to it. Invite it. In the degree that you open yourselves to it, its inflowing tide will course through your bodies, a force so vital that the old obstructions that are dominating them today will be driven out before it. My words are life to them that find them and health to all their flesh. There is a trough through which a stream of muddy water has been flowing for many days. The dirt has gradually collected on its sides and bottom, and it continues to collect as long as the muddy water flows through it. Change this. Open the trough to a swift flowing stream of clear crystal water in a very little while, even the very dirt that has collected on its sides and bottom will be carried away. The trough will be entirely cleansed. It will present an aspect of beauty and no longer an aspect of ugliness. And more, the water that now courses through it will be of value. It will be an agent of refreshment, of health, and of strength to those who use it. Yes, in just the degree that you realize your oneness with the infinite spirit of life, and thus actualize your latent possibilities and powers, you will exchange disease for ease, in harmony for harmony, suffering and pain for abounding health and strength. And in the degree that you realize this wholeness, this abounding health and strength in yourself, will you carry it to all with whom you come into contact? For we must remember that health is contagious as well as disease. I hear it asked, what can be said in a concrete way in regard to the practical applications of these truths so that one can hold himself in the enjoyment of a perfect body health? And more, that one may heal himself of any existing disease. In reply, let it be said that the chief thing that can be done is to point out the great underlying principle that each individual must make his own application. One person cannot well make this for another. First, let it be said that the very fact of one's holding the thought of perfect health sets into operation vital forces which will in time be more or less productive of the effect perfect health, then speaking more directly in regard to the great principle itself from its very nature, it is clear that more can be accomplished through the process of realization than through the process of affirmation. Though for some, affirmation may be a help, an aid to realization. In the degree, however, that you come into vital realization of your oneness with the infinite spirit of life, whence all life in individual form has come and is continually coming, and in the degree that through this realization you open yourself to its divine inflow, do you set into operation forces that will sooner or later bring even the physical body into a state of abounding health and strength. For to realize that this infinite spirit of life can from its very nature admit of no disease, and to realize that this then is the life in you, by realizing your oneness with it. You can so open yourself to its more abundant entrance that the diseased bodily condition effects will respond to the influences of its all-perfect power. This either quickly or more tardily, depending entirely upon yourself. There have been those who have been able to open themselves so fully to this realization that the healing has been instantaneous and permanent. The degree of intensity always eliminates in like degree the element of time. It must, however, be a calm, quiet, and expectant intensity rather than an intensity that is fearing, disturbed, and non-expectant. Then there are others who have come to this realization by degrees. Many will receive great help, and many will be entirely healed by a practice somewhat after the following nature. With a mind at peace, 
and with a heart going out in love to all, go into the quiet of your own interior self, holding the thought, I am one with the infinite spirit of life, the life of my life. I then as spirit, I, a spiritual being, can in my own real nature admit of no disease. I now open my body in which disease has gotten a foothold. I open it fully to the inflowing tide of this infinite life. And it now, even now, is pouring in and coursing through my body. And the healing process is going on. Realize this so fully that you begin to feel a quickening and a warming glow imparted by the life forces to the body. Believe the healing process is going on. Believe it and hold continually to it. Many people greatly desire a certain thing, but expect something else. They have greater faith in the power of evil than in the power of good and hence remain ill. If one will give himself to this meditation, realization, treatment, or whatever term it may seem best to use at stated times, as often as he may choose, and then continually hold himself in the same attitude of mind, thus allowing the force to work continually, he will be surprised how rapidly the body will be exchanging conditions of disease and in harmony for health and harmony. There is no particular reason, however, for this surprise, for in this way he is simply allowing the omnipotent power to do the work, which will have to do it ultimately in any case. If there is a local difficulty and one wants to open this particular portion in addition to the entire body, to this inflowing life, he can hold this particular portion in thought for to fix the thought in this way upon any particular portion of the body stimulates or increases the flow of the life forces in that portion. It must always be borne in mind, however, that whatever healing may be thus accomplished effects will not permanently cease until causes have been removed. In other words, as long as there is the violation of law, so long disease and suffering will result. This realization that we are considering will have an influence not only where there is a diseased condition of the body, but even where there is not this condition. It will give an increased bodily life, vigor, and power. We have had many cases in all times and in all countries of healing through the operation of the interior forces, entirely independent of external agencies. Various have been the methods, or rather various, have been the names applied to them. But the great law underlying all is one and the same, and the same today. When the master sent his followers forth, his injunction to them was to heal the sick and the afflicted as well as to teach the people. The early church fathers had the power of healing. In short, it was part of their work. And why should we not have the power today? The same as they had it then. Are the laws at all different? Identically the same. Why then? Simply because, with a few rare exceptions here and there, we are unable to get beyond the mere letter of the law into the real vital spirit and power. It is the letter that killeth. It is the spirit that giveth life and power. Every soul who becomes so individualized that he breaks through the mere letter and enters into the real vital spirit will have the power, as have all who have gone before. And when he does, he will also be the means of imparting it to others, for he will be one who will move and who will speak with authority. We are rapidly finding today, and we shall find even more and more as time passes, that practically all disease, with its consequent suffering, has its origin in perverted mental and emotional states and conditions. The mental attitude we take toward anything determines, to a greater or less extent, its effect upon us. If we fear it or if we antagonize it, the chances are that it will have detrimental or even disastrous effects upon us. If we come into harmony with it by quietly recognizing and inwardly asserting our superiority over it, in the degree that we are successfully to do this, in that degree will it carry with it no injury for us. No disease can enter into or take hold of our bodies unless it find therein something corresponding to itself which makes it possible. And in the same way, no evil or undesirable condition of any kind can come into our lives unless there is already in them that which invites it and so makes it possible for it to come. The sooner we begin to look within ourselves for the cause of whatever comes to us, 
the better it will be for so much, the sooner will we begin to make conditions within ourselves such that only good may enter. We who from our very natures should be masters of all conditions, by virtue of our ignorance, are mastered by almost numberless conditions of every description. Do I fear a draft? There is nothing in the draft, a little purifying current of God's pure air, to cause me trouble, to bring on a cold, perhaps an illness. The draft can affect me only in the degrees that I myself make it possible, only in the degree that I allow it to affect me. We must distinguish between cause and mere occasions. The draft is not cause, nor does it carry cause with it. Two persons are sitting in the same draft. The one is injuriously affected by it. The other experiences not even an inconvenience, but he rather enjoys it. The one is a creature of circumstances. He fears the draft, cringes before it, continually thinks of the harm it is doing him. In other words, he opens every avenue of it to enter and take hold of him, and so it harmless and beneficent in itself brings to him exactly what he has empowered it to bring. The other recognizes himself as the master over and not the creature of circumstances. He is not concerned about the draft. He puts himself into harmony with it, makes himself positive to it, and instead of experiencing any discomfort, he enjoys it, and in addition to its doing him a service by bringing the pure fresh air from without to him, it does him the additional service of hardening him even more to any future conditions of a like nature. But if the draft was cause, it would bring the same results to both. The fact that it does not shows that it is not a cause, but a condition, and it brings to each effects which correspond to the conditions it finds within each. Poor draft. How many thousands, nay millions of times, it is made the scapegoat by those who are too ignorant or too unfair to look their own weaknesses square in the face, and who instead becoming imperial masters remain cringing slaves. Think of it, what it means. A man created in the image of the eternal God, sharer of his life and power, born to have dominion, fearing, shaking, cringing before a little draft of pure life-giving air. But scapegoats are convenient things, even if the only thing they do for us is to aid us in our constant efforts at self-delusion. The best way to disarm a draft of the bad effects it has been accustomed to bring one is first to bring about a pure and healthy set of conditions within. Then, to change one's mental attitude toward it. Recognize the fact that, of itself, it has no power. It has only the power you invest it with. Thus, you will put yourself into harmony with it, and will no longer sit in fear of it, then sit in a draft a few times and get hardened to it, as everyone, by going at it judiciously, can readily do. But suppose one is in delicate health, or especially subject to drafts, then be simply a little judicious at first. Don't seek the strongest that can be found, especially if you do not as yet, in your own mind, feel equal to it. For if you do not, it signifies that you still fear it. That supreme regulator of all life, good common sense, must be used here the same as elsewhere. If we are born to have dominion, that we are is demonstrated by the fact that some have attained to it, and what one has done soon or late, all can do, then it is not necessary that we live under the domination of any physical agent. In the degree that we recognize our own interior powers, then we are rulers and able to dictate. In the degree that we fail to recognize them, we are slaves and are dictated to. We build whatever we find within us. We attract whatever comes to us, and it all in accordance with spiritual law, for all natural law is spiritual law. The whole of human life is cause and effect. There is no such thing in it as chance, nor is there even in all the wide universe. Are we not satisfied with whatever comes into our lives? The thing to do, then, is not to spend time in railing against the imaginary something we create and call fate, but to look to the within and change the causes at work there in order that things of a different nature may come, for there will come exactly what we cause to come. This is true not only of the physical body, but of all phases and conditions of life. We invite whatever comes, and did we not invite it, either consciously or unconsciously? It could not, and it would not come. 
This may undoubtedly be hard for some to believe and even to see at first, but in the degree that one candidly and open-mindedly looks at it and then studies into the silent but subtle and, so to speak, omnipotent workings of the thought forces, and as he traces their effects within him and about him, it becomes clearly evident and easy to understand. And then whatever does come to one depends for its effects entirely upon his mental attitude toward it. Does this or that occurrence or condition cause you annoyance? Very well. It causes you annoyance and so disturbs your peace merely because you allow it to. You are born to have absolute control over your own dominion. But if you voluntarily hand over this power, even for a little while, to someone or something else, then you, of course, become the creature, the one controlled. To live undisturbed by passing occurrences, you must first find your own center. You must then be firm in your own center and so rule the world from within. He who does not himself condition circumstances allows the process to be reversed and becomes a conditioned circumstance. Find your center and live in it. Surrender it to no person, to no thing. In the degree that you do this, will you find yourself growing stronger and stronger in it. And how can one find his center? By realizing his oneness with the infinite power and by living continually in this realization. But if you do not rule from your own center, if you invest this or that with the power of bringing your annoyance or evil or harm, then take what it brings, but cease your railings against the eternal goodness and beneficence of all things. I swear the earth shall surely be complete to him or her who shall be complete. The earth remains jagged and broken only to him who remains jagged and broken. If the windows of your soul are dirty and streaked, covered with matter foreign to them, then the world as you look out of them will be be to you dirty and streaked and out of order. Cease your complainings. However, keep your pessimism, your poor unfortunate me to yourself, lest you betray the fact that your windows are badly in need of something. But know that your friend who keeps his windows clean, that the eternal sun may illumine all within and make visible all without. Know that he lives in a different world from yours. Then go wash your windows and instead of longing for some other world, you will discover the wonderful beauties of this world. And if you don't find transcendent beauties on every hand here, the chances are that you will never find them anywhere. The poem hangs on the berry bush when comes the poet's eye. And the whole street is a masquerade when Shakespeare passes by. This same Shakespeare whose mere passing causes all this commotion, is the one who put into the mouth of one of his creations the words, The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves, that we are underlings. And the great work of his own life is right good evidence that he realized full well the truth of the facts that we are considering. And again, he gave us a great truth in keeping with what we are considering when he said, our doubts are traitors and make us lose the good we oft might win by fearing to attempt. There's probably no agent that brings us more undesirable conditions than fear. We should live in fear of nothing, nor will we when we come fully to know ourselves. An old French proverb runs, some of your griefs you have cured and the sharpest you still have survived. But what torments of pain you endured from evils that never arrived. Fear and lack of faith go hand in hand. The one is born of the other. Tell me how much one is given to fear, and I will tell you how much he lacks in faith. Fear is a most expensive guest to entertain, the same as worry is. So expensive are they that no one can afford to entertain them. We invite what we fear, the same as, by a different attitude of mind, we invite and attract the influences and conditions we desire. The mind dominated by fear opens the door for the entrance of the very things, for the actualization of the very conditions it fears. Where are you going? asked an Eastern pilgrim on meeting the plague one day. I'm going to Baghdad to kill 5,000 people, was the reply. 
A few days later, the same pilgrim met the plague returning. You told me you were going to Baghdad to kill 5,000 people, said he, but instead you killed 50,000. No, said the plague. I killed only 5,000, as I told you. I would. The others died of fright. Fear can paralyze every muscle in the body. Fear affects the flow of the blood. Likewise, the normal and healthy action of all the life forces. Fear can make the body rigid, motionless, and powerless to move. Not only do we attract ourselves the things we fear, but we also aid in attracting to others the conditions we in our own minds hold them in fear of. This we do in proportion to the strength of our own thought and in the degree that they are sensitively organized and so influenced by our thought and this, although it be unconscious both on their part and on ours. Children, especially when very young are, generally speaking, more sensitive to their surrounding influences than grown people are. Some are veritable little sensitive plates, registering the influences about them and embodying them as they grow. How careful in their prevailing mental states, then, should be those who have them in charge, and especially how careful should a mother be during the time she is carrying the child. And when every thought, every mental as well as emotional state has its direct influence upon the life of the unborn child. Let parents be careful how they hold a child, either younger or older, in the thought of fear. This is many times done unwittingly on their part, through anxiety, and at times through what might well be termed overcare, which is fully as bad as undercare. I know of a number of cases where a child has been so continually held in the thought of fear, lest this or that condition come upon him, that the very things that were feared have been drawn to him, which probably otherwise never would have come at all. Many times there has been no adequate basis for the fear. In case there is a basis, then far wiser is it to take exactly the opposite attitude so as to neutralize the force at work, and then to hold the child in the thought of wisdom and strength that it may be able to meet the condition and master it, instead of being mastered by it. But a day or two ago, a friend was telling me of an experience of his own life in this connection. At a period when he was having a terrific struggle with a certain habit, he was so continually held in the thought of fear by his mother and the young lady to whom he was engaged. The engagement to be consummated at the end of a certain period, the time depending on his proving his mastery, that he very sensitively organized, continually felt the depressing and weakening effects of their negative thoughts. He could always tell exactly how they felt toward him. He was continually influenced and weakened by their fear, by their questionings, by their suspicions, all of which had the effect of lessening the sense of his own power, all of which had an endeavor paralyzing influence upon him. And so instead of their begetting courage and strength in him, they brought him to a still greater realization of his own weakness and the almost worthless use of struggle. Here were two who loved him dearly, and who would have done anything and everything to help him gain the mastery, but who, ignorant of the silent, subtle, ever-working, and all-telling power of the thought forces, instead of imparting to him courage, instead of adding to his strength, disarmed him of this, and then added an additional weakness from without. In this way, the battle for him was made harder in a threefold degree. Fear and worry in all kindred mental states are too expensive for any person, man, woman, or child, to entertain or indulge in. Fear paralyzes healthy action. Worry corrodes and pulls down the organism and will finally tear it to pieces. Nothing is to be gained by it, but everything to be lost. Long-continued grief at any loss will do the same. Each brings its own peculiar type of ailment. An inordinate love of gain, a close-fisted hoarding disposition will have kindred effects. Anger, jealousy, malice, continual fault-finding, lust has each its own peculiar corroding, weakening, tearing down effects. We shall find that not only are happiness and prosperity concomitants of righteousness, living in harmony with the higher laws, but bodily health as well. The great Hebrew seer enunciated a wonderful chemistry of life when he said, As righteousness tendeth to life, so he that pursueth evil pursueth it to his own death. On the other hand, in the way of righteousness is life, and in the pathway thereof there is no death. The time will come 
when it will be seen that this means far more than most people dare even to think as yet. It rests with man to say whether his soul shall be housed in a stately mansion of ever-growing splendor and beauty, or in a hovel of his own building, a hovel at last ruined and abandoned to decay. The bodies of almost untold members living their one-sided, unbalanced lives are every year through these influences weakening and falling by the wayside long before their time. Poor, poor houses, intended to be beautiful temples brought to desolation by their ignorant, reckless, deluded tenants. Poor houses. A close observer, a careful student of the power of thought forces will soon be able to read in the voice, in the movements, in the features, the effects registered by the prevailing mental states and conditions. Or if he is told the prevailing mental states and conditions, he can describe the voice, the movements, the features, as well as describe in a general way the peculiar physical ailments that possessor is heir to. We are told by good authority that a study of the human body, its structure, and the length of time it takes it to come to maturity in comparison with the time it takes the bodies of various animals and their corresponding longevity reveals the fact that its natural age should be near 120 years than what we commonly find it today. But think of the multitudes all about us whose bodies are aging, weakening, breaking, so that they have to abandon them long before they reach what ought to be a long period of strong, vigorous middle life. Then the natural length of life being thus shortened, it comes to be what we might term a race belief that this shortened period is the natural period. And as a consequence, many, when they approach a certain age, seeing that as a rule people at this period of life begin to show signs of age to break and go downhill, as we say, they thinking it a matter of course and that it must be the same with them by taking this attitude of mind many times bring upon themselves these very conditions long before it is necessary subtle and powerful are the influences of the mind in the building and rebuilding of the body as we understand them better it may become the custom for people to look forward with pleasure to the teens of their second century there comes to mind at this moment a friend, a lady well on to 80 years of age, an old lady, some, most people in fact would call her especially those who measure age by the number of the seasons that have come and gone since one's birth, but to call her a friend old would be to call black white. She is no older than a girl of 25 and indeed younger, I am glad to say, or I am sorry to say, depending upon the point of view, than many a girl of this age. Seeking for the good in all people and in all things, she has found the good everywhere. The brightness of disposition and of voice that is hers today, that attracts all people to her, and that makes her so beautifully attractive to all people, has characterized her all through life. It has in turn carried brightness and hope and courage and strength to hundreds and thousands of people through all these years, and will continue to do so apparently for many years yet to come. No fears. No worryings, no hatreds, no jealousies, no sorrowings, no grievings, no sordid graspings after inordinate gain have found entrance into her realm of thought. As a consequence, her mind, free from these abnormal states and conditions, has not externalized in her body the various physical ailments that the great majority of people are lugging about with them, thinking in their ignorance that they are natural and that it is all in accordance with the eternal order of things that they should have them. Her life has been one of the varied experiences, so that all these things would have found ready entrance into the realm of her mind, and so into her life were she ignorant enough to allow them entrance. On the contrary, she has been wise enough to recognize the fact that in one kingdom at least she is ruler, the kingdom of her mind, and that it is hers to dictate as to what shall and what shall not enter there. She knows, moreover, that in determining this, she is determining all the conditions of her life. It is indeed a pleasure as well as an inspiration to see her as she goes here and there to see her sunny disposition, her youthful step, to hear her joyous laughter. Indeed, and in truth, Shakespeare knew whereof he spoke when he said, It is the mind that makes the body rich. With great pleasure I watched her, but recently as she was walking along the street, stopping to have a word, and so 
a part in the lives of a group of children at play by the wayside, hastening her step a little to have a word with a washerwoman toting her bundle of clothes, stopping for a word with a laboring man returning with dinner pail in hand from his work, returning the recognition from the lady in her carriage, and so imparting some of her own rich life to all with whom she came into contact. And as good fortune would have it, while still watching her, an old lady passed her, really old this one, though at least ten or fifteen years younger so far as the count by the seasons is concerned. Nevertheless, she was bent in form and apparently stiff in joint and muscle. Silent in mood, she wore a countenance, a long face sadness, which was intensified, surely several fold, by a black somber headgear with an immense heavy veil, still more somber, looking if possible. Her entire dress was of this description, by this relic of barbarism garb, combined with her own mood and expression, she continually proclaimed to the world two things, her own personal sorrows and woes, which by this very method she kept continually fresh in her mind, and also her lack of faith in the eternal goodness of things, her lack of faith in the love and eternal goodness of the infinite Father. Wrapped only in the thoughts of her own ailments and sorrows and woes, she received and she gave nothing of joy, nothing of hope, nothing of courage, nothing of value to those whom she passed or with whom she came in contact. But on the contrary, she suggested to all and helped to intensify in many those mental states all too prevalent in our common human life. And as she passed our friend, one could notice a slight turn of the head, which coupled with the expression in her face seemed to indicate this as her thought. Your dress and your conduct are not wholly in keeping with the lady of your years. Thank God then, thank God they are not. And may he in his great goodness and love send us an innumerable company of the same rare type. And may they live a thousand years to bless mankind, to impart the life-giving influences of their own royal lives to the numerous ones all about us who stand so much in need of them. Would you remain always young? And would you carry all the joyousness and buoyancy of youth into your mature years? Then have care concerning but one thing, how you live in your thought world. This will determine all. It was the inspired one, Gautama the Buddha, who said, The mind is everything, what you think you become. And the same thing had Ruskin in mind when he said, Make yourself nests of pleasant thoughts. None of us as yet know, for none of us have been taught in early youth what fairy palaces we may build of beautiful thought, proof against all adversity. And would you have in your body all the elasticity, all the strength, all the beauty of your younger years? Then live these in your mind, making no room for unclean thought, and you will externalize them in your body. In the degree that you keep young in thought, will you remain young in body, and you will find that your body will in turn aid your mind, for body helps mind the same as mind builds body. You are continually building and so externalizing in your body conditions most akin to the thoughts and emotions you entertain. And not only are you so building from within, but you are also continually drawing from without forces of a kindred nature. Your particular kind of thought connects you with a similar order of thought from without. It is bright, hopeful, cheerful. You connect yourself with a current of thought of this nature. It is sad, fearing, despondent. Then this is the order of thought you connect yourself with. If the latter is the order of your thought, then perhaps unconsciously and by degrees you've been connecting yourself with it. You need to go back and pick up again a part of your child nature with its careless and cheerful type of thought. The minds of the group of children at play are unconsciously concentrated in drawing to their bodies a current of playful thought. Place a child by itself, deprive it of its companions, and soon it will mope and become slow of movement. It is cut off from that particular thought current and it is literally out of its element. You need to bring again this current of playful thought to you which has gradually been turned off. You are too serious or sad or absorbed in the serious affairs of life. You can be playful and cheerful without being puerile or silly. You can carry on business all the better for being in the playful mood when your mind is off your business. There is nothing but ill resulting from the permanent mood of sadness and seriousness. The mood which by many so long maintained makes it actually difficult for them to smile at all. 
at 18 or 20, you commenced growing out of the more playful tendency of early youth. You took hold of the more serious side of life. You went into some business. You became more or less involved in its cares, perplexities, and responsibilities. Or as man or woman, you entered on some phase of life involving care or trouble. Or you became absorbed in some game of business, which, as you followed it, left no time for play. Then as you associated with older people, you absorbed their old ideas, their mechanical methods of thinking, their acceptance of errors, without question or thought of question. In all of this, you opened your mind to a heavy, care-laden current of thought. Into this, you glided unconsciously. That thought is materialized in your blood and flesh. The seeing of your body is a deposit or crystallization of the unseen element ever flowing to your body from your mind. Years pass on and you find that your movements are stiff and cumbrous, that you can with difficulty climb a tree as at 14. Your mind has all this time been sending to your body these heavy, inelastic elements making your body what now it is. Your change for the better must be gradual and can only be accomplished by bringing the thought current of an all-around symmetrical strength to bear on it, by demanding of the supreme power to be led in the best way by diverting your mind from the many unhealthy thoughts which habitually have been flowing into it without you knowing it to healthier ones. Like the beast, the bodies of those of our race have in the past weakened and decayed, this will not always be. Increase of spiritual knowledge will show the cause of such decay, and will show also how to take advantage of a law or force to build us up, renew ever the body, and give it greater and greater strength instead of blindly using the law or force, as has been done in the past, to weaken our bodies and finally destroy them. Full, rich, and abounding health is the normal and the natural condition of life. Anything else is an abnormal condition, and abnormal conditions as a rule come through perversions. God never created sickness, suffering, and disease. They are man's own creations. They come through his violating the laws under which he lives. So used are we to seeing them that we come gradually, if not to think of them as natural, then to look upon them as a matter of course. The time will come when the work of the physician will not be to treat and attempt to heal the body, but to heal the mind, which in turn will heal the body. In other words, the true physician will be a teacher. His work will be to keep people well instead of attempting to make them well after sickness and disease comes on. And still, beyond this, there will come a time when each will be his own physician. In the degree that we live in harmony with the higher laws of our being, and so in the degree that we become better acquainted with the powers of the mind and spirit, will we give less attention to the body, no less care but less attention. The bodies of thousands today would be much better cared for if their owners gave them less thought and attention. As a rule, those who think least of their bodies enjoy the best health. Many are kept in continual ill health by the abnormal thought and attention they give them. Give the body the nourishment, the exercise, the fresh air, the sunlight it requires. Keep it clean and then think of it as little as possible. In your thoughts and in your conversations, never dwell upon the negative side. Don't talk of sickness and disease. By talking of these, you do yourself harm and you do harm to those who listen to you. Talk of those things that will make people feel better for listening to you. Thus you will infect them with health and strength and not with weakness and disease. To dwell upon the negative side is always destructive. This is true of the body, the same as it is true of all other things. The following from one whose thorough training as a physician has been supplemented by extensive study and observations along the lines of the powers of interior forces are of special significance and value in this connection. We can never gain health by contemplating disease any more than we can reach perfection by dwelling upon imperfection or harmony through discord, we should keep a high ideal of health and harmony constantly before the mind. Never affirm or repeat about your health what you do not wish to be true. Do not dwell upon your ailments, nor study your symptoms. Never allow yourself to be convinced that you are not complete master of yourself. Stoutly affirm your superiority over bodily ills, and do not acknowledge yourself the slave of any inferior power. I would teach children early to build a strong barrier between themselves and disease by healthy habits of thought, high thinking, and purity of life. 
I would teach them to expel all thoughts of death, all images of disease, all discordant emotions like hatred, malice, revenge, envy, and sensuality, as they would banish a temptation to do evil. I would teach them that bad food, bad drink, or bad air makes bad blood, that bad blood makes bad tissue and bad flesh bad morals. I would teach them that healthy thoughts are as essential to healthy bodies as pure thoughts to a clean life. I would teach them to cultivate a strong willpower and to brace themselves against life's enemies in every possible way. I would teach the sick to have hope, confidence, cheer. Our thoughts and imaginations are the only real limits to our possibilities. No man's success or health will ever reach beyond his own confidence. As a rule, we erect our own barriers, like produces like the universe through Hatred, envy, malice, jealousy, and revenge all have children. Every bad thought breeds others, and each of these goes on and on, ever reproducing itself until our world is peopled with their offspring. A true physician and parent of the future will not medicate the body with drugs so much as the mind with principles. The coming mother will teach her child to assuage the fear of anger, hatred, malice, with the great panacea of the world, love. The coming physician will teach the people to cultivate cheerfulness, goodwill, and noble deeds for a healthy tonic, as well as a heart tonic, and that a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. The health of your body, the same as the health and strength of your mind, depends upon what you relate yourself with. The infinite spirit of life, this source of life, can from its very nature we found admit of no weakness, no disease. Come then into the full, conscious, vital realization of your oneness with this infinite life. Open yourself to its more abundant entrance and follow an ever-renewing bodily health and strength will be yours. And good may ever conquer ill, health walk where pain has trod. As a man thinketh, so is he. Rise, then, and think with God. The whole matter may then be summed up in the one sentence, God is well, and so are you. You must awaken to the knowledge of your real being. When this awakening comes, you will have, and you will see, that you have the power to determine what conditions are externalized in your body. You must recognize you must realize yourself as one with infinite spirit. God's will is then your will. Your will is God's will. And with God, all things are possible. When we are able to do away with all sense of separateness by living continually in the realization of this oneness, not only will our bodily ills and weaknesses vanish, but all limitations along all lines. Then delight thyself in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Then you will feel like crying all the day long. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a goodly heritage. Drop out of mind your belief in good things and good events coming to you in the future. Come now into the real life and coming appropriate and actualize them now. Remember that only the best is good enough for one with a heritage so royal as yours. We buy ashes for bread, we buy diluted wine. Give me the true, whose ample leaves and tendrils cured. Among the silver hills of heaven, draw everlasting dew. And that is the wonderful chapter on the infinite spirit of life, health, and bodily vigor from In Tune with the Infinite, by Ralph Waldo Trine. The reason I like this so much is how uniquely true it is today as it was back then. How easily we make ourselves sick, how we do it so often. I know this and have seen this personally in my life. My mother died at a very early age from colon cancer, and she would worry about me and my sister all the time. Of course, this is coming from love, but these fears and worries made her sick and it drew thought forces into our lives all the time. And she was unable to stop pulling in these thought currents. She was obsessed 
She was always worried all the time. And eventually, it killed her. It entered into her body, and she couldn't let it go. And I've seen it so many times with people in my life that get into certain habits of fear, of anger, of loss, the way they share their diseases, where they talk about themselves. Some people, they need to be sick. They don't get attention without being sick. And then it becomes this infinite loop. They act like they're sick to get attention. Then they become sick because they're acting like they're sick. I see it all the time. Don't play games with this stuff. There's an infinite life power that is running through your body that heals everything. I believe strongly that we could live for thousands, if not millions of years. I believe that. I believe there's technologies available for medical beds and entirely new ways to regenerate our bodies in the future, even move our consciousness, that if we stay healthy long enough that we will be able to live forever. I believe that. I think that that's what's happening. There's incredible things happening in the world and we can heal ourselves and we're coming to understand this process. It's hard. It's hard. A lot of times we're thinking very natural thoughts for the situation and it's killing us. Law of attraction or the mind-body connection is horrible. It's terrible. We try to make it a wonderful thing, but the truth of it is it kills you. It is deadly to pull in certain thought streams. As it says, it's so expensive you can't afford it. I recently found myself falling into this trap, just worrying about finances, worrying about business structure, legal things, things that just come up normally with any business. And I just found like I was imagining the worst possible things happening. And I was getting sick in my stomach, trying to block it out, having to let it go. And I just tried to realize that I had been creating all these sickness in my body from worries. And it wasn't anything else but myself, my own mind creating this. And I was killing myself, even though I thought I was trying to help my business or think of the right thing or worry. I think I was taught worrying from my mother in the womb. My mom worried and worried her whole life. I was used to those emotions. I know that many of you have the same thing. And like he said about the draft, oh, I just caught a draft. You can't catch a draft. It's so easy to find and make up excuses. It's such a delicate process an understanding of how your mind affects your body. It's hard. It's difficult. People need to go to workshops. That's what all of Dr. Joe Dispenza's stuff is really about, is overcoming your body and transcending it because it's hard. And you got to figure out that your thoughts control your mind and you can fundamentally cure yourself right now. It's a very powerful thing. And this really evokes that. This makes me think about that in so many different ways. The life force is running through you. The infinite life force is running through you. And you can live forever. We should live 120 years, as he says here. But I believe it's even longer. Don't give up. Don't create things to fear about. Don't worry about things. Don't make yourself sick when there's no need to do that. There is no need to get sick most of the time. You're worried about something. It's not going to happen. I'm sending out blessings of infinite goodness to everyone listening reprogramming your timelines to infinite good everything's going to be okay nothing to worry about don't let these things that you start to think or worry about make yourself sick and i'm telling that to myself so please put a like on this video and let me know how you deal with your own body as you let thoughts protrude and affect your own health it happens to everybody and it feels like i'm more sensitive than i was in the past Seems like every day, as the light increases, I'm more sensitive to my body and my own thoughts. So I have to learn and get better and better at it. I do it through my breath and all the things we talk about on the podcast, but I would love to know what you do. In any case, I love you all. Sending out wonderful thoughts of joy and bliss to everyone. All episodes of The Reality Revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution.